So basically this uric acid phenomena is really not well understood by most physicians. It's really driven by diet, but not only our processed diet and high fructose corn syrup. Uh, and it, and it drives all these secondary effects of cardiovascular disease, death, Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes. Uh, and it's something that you, you can actually easily measure. Your doctor can check it for you when you go to the office. It should be less than five and a half, as you said. Um, what should we do in terms of our diet to reduce uric acid? And what are the worst things that cause uric acid? And what, what actually helps reduce uric acid? Sure. Let's let's talk about the causes uh, or, or the sources of, of uric acid. Where is it coming from? Mm. And uh, did we mention fructose? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you did. Fructose is the gorilla in the room, right? So fructose again, was our signal that scarcity was coming, that winter is coming, eat the berries. Fructose is telling your body, make fat, raise blood sugar, uh, raise blood pressure because you might not have water to drink. Mm. So fructose is by and large the biggest player. Fruit juice, sodas, added to sauces, uh, added to just about anything that's in a package these days. Salad dressing. <laughs> you bet. Uh, and we love it because it's Tomato sweet. sauce. Ketchup. And again, fruit is okay. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Not apples and cherries and, and you know high fructose uh, fruits all day long, but have some fruit by all means. Right. Uh, the next thing to consider that's certainly less important are something called purines. Purines, all fruits, vegetables, and meats, really anything we eat has in it some DNA and RNA. When our bodies break that down, uh, then purines are formed and purines are directly metabolized into uric acid. And interestingly, uric acid favors that and enhances the production of purines in our bodies. Again, a feed forward cycle, it's trying to keep us alive during times of food scarcity. So Again, we want to avoid those foods that are really rich in purines. I mentioned them already, the organ meats, uh, the shellfish, the smaller fish that we were favoring over time, the anchovies and the sardines. Sure, you can have the anchovies in your in your uh, Caesar salad, but you don't want to make big meals having six ounces or more of, of any of those. Oh, I love anchovies. And, yeah, me too. I, white anchovies, one of my favorites. And the last thing to consider, I think it needs a little bit of, uh, we need to double click on this a bit, and that is alcohol. Uh, because alcohol shares the exact same metabolic pathway as fructose. Uh, as Robert Lustig has called it, uh, uh, fructose is, the, uh, is alcohol without the buzz. So it, it similarly consumes ATP down to AMP. Um, but in this case, it really matters what kind of alcohol a person is drinking. Wine consumption in med, men has about zero effect on uric acid. Wine consumption in women actually is associated with lower uric acid. Uh, hard liquor will raise uric acid, but the worst offender is beer. Why? Because beer mm. not only contains alcohol, but it contains purines that we just talked about uh, uh. from the yeast, the brewer's yeast that is used to make beer. So now we understand the biochemistry that underlies the beer belly. It's coming from this elevation of uric acid, packing the fat away, getting ready for winter. So uh, if you're going to choose a beverage, coffee, a, a good choice, actually associated with lower uric acid. So those are the big things that we should avoid. I'll make one other comment as it relates to high purine foods. Many people will pull up a list of high purine foods and see many vegetables, uh, things like uh, broccoli, the cruciferous vegetables in general, like kale. Uh, many vegetables have high levels, higher levels of purines. Their consumption though, is associated with lower uric acid. Why? Because again, mm. fiber, uh, bioflavonoids, vitamin C, which increases uric acid excretion. Uh, so eat, eat all the vegetables like that, that you want. There's, you'll never mm -hmm. hear, I don't never say never, but it's going to be hard for me to imagine there'll be a, there'll be a time when I tell people not to eat broccoli or broccoli exactly. sprouts. Right. That's, that's so, going to be a tough, a tough one so, for me. So what are the foods that help bring it down? Because if it's elevated, right. you can stop so, eating the purine foods and the sugar foods and the high fructose corn syrup foods. What are the so things that actually So we know that uh, foods down? that uh, are rich in certain bioflavonoids, for example, quercetin is a very uh, powerful bioflavonoid. Yes, it's an antioxidant. Yes, it has anti-inflammatory activity. But here is the exciting news about quercetin. A recent study out of Britain uh, demonstrates that 500 milligrams of quercetin a day in just two weeks 
uh, is associated with an 8% lowering of uric acid. That's really significant. So wow. taking quercetin as a supplement is, is an idea, along with uh, vitamin C. Luteolin also dramatically lowers a uric acid on par uh, with allopurinol, wow. which is a pharmaceutical. Wow. It's one-to-one, -one, uh, just about equal to the drug used for gout patients to lower their uric acid. So luteolin and quercetin, very powerful. Vitamin C aids in excretion. Uh, I like to round out the, uh, the program with DHA. It doesn't have direct effects on um, on the pathways that we're talking about, but it does tend to offset some of the damaging effects of, of fructose in the human body. So uh, those in terms of supplements would be good choices. Now, you know, the, the diet then that you hear me outlining uh, would be one that is mostly plant-based. This is the grain brain doctor who many people said was just the next Adkins telling us all to eat bacon bits. That's not what we're saying. It's not yeah. what I've ever said, but more of a plant-based, higher fiber, colorful. Mm -hmm. That's where the bioflavonoids are. Colorful a type of plate, that's what we're looking for. It's more sustainable. It's better for you. It's better for your gut bacteria, and it will help bring down your uric acid levels. So um, one of the things I often use was cherries, cherry extract, right. which seems a little contradictory because it's a fruit, it's got fructose in it. But, uh, you know, I've often treated my patients with high uric acid or gout with cherry extract and found it very effective. It is very effective. It's more effective in women than in men. Uh, but tart cherry uh, is, is on the list. A, a cup of cherries, uh, you know, that's what was used in several studies. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the cover of the book, and I just happen to have one right here, look at the O of the drop acid. That's the cherry. So you're, you're exactly right. Uh, dropping uh, acid Uric acid uh, using cherries been used for gout therapy for, for many, many years. And vitamin C too. Vitamin C, quercetin's a little newer to the game, but you know, for a long time, a gout patients were told to take vitamin C uh, and or you know, consume vitamin C rich foods, but not fruit juice. You know, there's yeah. really uh, nothing uh, ancestral about uh, consuming fruit juice. It's not like our, our hunter gatherer forebears would have been uh, stumbled upon trees with, uh, you know, cans and bottles of fruit juice hanging from them and then consume them. That's a powerful uh, yeah. to load that, yeah. um, you know, that, that's really unlike anything that our physiology is ready for. It's staggering how many people have really been brainwashed to think that fruit juice is a healthy drink. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, a lot of media. Eat and, you the fruits, get the juice. I live in Florida and, you know, orange juice orange is juice, yeah. nature. Uh, I need a Brian. You're not having, you're not having <laughs> orange juice. What's wrong with you? You didn't have your breakfast until 12 o'clock noon. Again, what's wrong with you? I guess there are a lot of things wrong with me because I take, a, take plenty of criticism. But, you know, that, that said, uh, it's the Orange Juice Growers Association or whomever is the lobby that wants us to do certain things that, you know, the whole grain goodness of these processed cereals that we think is heart healthy, all of this messaging that we've been getting for years and years is hugely effective. And uh, it's what people think is the right thing. You know, your breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Maybe it is, uh, but it doesn't mean a powerful carbohydrate load at eight o'clock in the morning is going to set you on your way. So you know, that's our mission. You and me and so many people is to kind of, you know, let people hear the other side of the story so they can be better architects of their health destiny. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a problem is, that, you know, all the things that we're pointing to that we both talked about forever are all really driving this final common pathway of insulin resistance and inflammation that's sort of underlying all these chronic illnesses from heart disease to diabetes to cancer to Alzheimer's, depression, lots more. And, and what you're saying is that a lot of this may be mediated by this mechanism of uric acid, which is directly related to these sort of load of fructose that's in our diet since probably the 1970s when high fructose corn syrup started to be used in almost all industrial food products. And it's now really the majority of the sugar that we're consuming. Um, and it's quite different than regular sugar. I mean, e but even regular sugar can be a problem, right? Even if you just have regular sugar, it can cause this, right? Because regular sugar has high oh, it is immediately, glucose yeah, and fructose. Yeah. You know, it's fructose, in this case, bound to glucose, but that 
separation takes place immediately in the small intestine that uh, we then liberate fructose. And interestingly, here's another uh, bit of trivia, but I think it's relevant in our because yeah. of the amount of sodium added to our foods, the amount of sodium that people are consuming, that this salt in our bloodstream activates uh, enzymes that actually create fructose from glucose. The enzyme is something wow, called wow. aldolase reductase. But uh, so mm. we're actually making fructose in our bodies from a glucose to again, you know, prepare it's like a double whammy. Yeah, and but again, it, and it's the sugar in our diets. And you know, as you know, every five years, our government puts out these guidelines. And uh, we wrote. Uh, uh, Dr. Casey Means is a. Uh, an individual involved in, you know, getting yeah. out information about blood sugar. You, I'm sure you know her. Yeah, and she's been on our we podcast wrote, for and, sure. Mm -hmm, we wrote an op-ed in MedPage today that was published February 21st of 21. It was a letter to President Biden saying, "Look, basically, uh, all the scientists who were involved in creating, you know, giving the information for the USDA to make this uh, policy uh, indicated that we need to consume less sugar." And yet they didn't lower the the number of calories derived from sugar is still 10%, what the government recommends. That was not during the Biden administration, but we were hoping that there could be some intervention to get it down to about 6% of total calories derived from uh, sugar, because it's the big villain. I mean, you know, uh, really so many is, yeah. people that you've interviewed uh, have talked about it. It is the big villain. So David, what about flour? Because, you know, in my world, there's not that much difference between flour and sugar. Is that also an issue? Of course it is. And so again, you know, anything, uh, we create these feedback uh, loops whereby, um, whereby we enhance these processes that are designed to be enhanced uh, to keep us alive. And as it relates to flour, you know, that will directly uh, elevate our blood sugar. What does that do? That increases insulin resistance. What happens to insulin when it's not working very well? It goes up. Now, here's where the feed forward plays in. It's really quite fascinating. Mm. Higher levels of insulin, that can be a consequence of eating refined carbs like flour, higher levels of insulin increase uric acid by inhibiting the excretion of uric acid in the kidney. So now we've tapped into the whole process of uric acid elevation, everything you and I have been talking about, by virtue of the fact that we're eating these refined carbohydrates. So again, you know, yeah. that just activates this mechanism saying, oh my gosh, you're not going to have food very soon. You had better start making fat. You better start mm -hmm. retaining salt uh, because you may not have water. You better uh, start increasing your sugar production through the liver, a process called yeah. gluconeogenesis, to power your brain so you can find food. You know, that's our ace in the hole. We got a great, we're not the strongest, we're not the fastest but we have this brain that can help us find food. And you know, our biggest r issues uh, throughout our history were starvation and predation. In other words, either, either we found food or we were food for somebody else who, who yeah. would eat us. And again, what has saved humans has been the fact that we got this big brain. I don't know if it's saving us anymore, uh, another discussion perhaps, but you know, the fact that we can survive by our wits that's what it's been, that we can find food. We can realize we don't want to go to a certain place because there might be an animal there that can eat us. You know, this is how we survive. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. What we're now finding out is that fatty liver is the thing that is uh, being driven by disruption of the gut microbiome. So what's happening is when you destroy the mucus, the protective mucus lining of the gut, some of those bad bacteria get into the into the 